Hello, we're here today with an amazing guest, Jean-Michel Cousteau, and uh, we're going to talk about your documentary that's coming out on wide screens all over the place, all over the world. Um, could you please tell us about this project? Well, Wonders of the Sea is uh, a film that is allowing us to show to the public worldwide images, behavior of creatures that I cannot see after 73 years of scuba diving. With the equipment on tripods on the bottom of the ocean, wherever we are, uh, we film it in slow motion, up close. We bring it up to the surface and we try to put it on the screen on the boat where we are and uh, if it's good, it's good. If it's not good, we have to go right back to do it again. And sometimes three times or four mm -hmm. times. And uh, so it's a unique way for us to see the behavior of nature, which we cannot see with the mm -hmm. naked eyes. How can we protect what we don't understand? Well, now we understand more and more. And that's why we want to do more and more of that kind of research. Now, obviously, we also want us to understand how connected we are right. with all these creatures which we don't understand, how they reproduce, how they behave, and on and on. Mm -hmm. And that technology allows us to share now with the public in 3D, mm -hmm. <laughs> on a big screen, uh, images nobody has ever seen before. Yeah. So, a little bit about your mission. My mission, you see, uh, uh, making a, a show like this is uh, engaging a lot of technicians and scientists and so on. But I wanted to make sure that we were passing on to the public the mission of Ocean Futures, Ocean Futures Society, which I created after my father passed away, uh, to honor his philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I've never stopped doing that. And so our mission is, if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself. we all connected to the ocean one way or the other. There's only one water system. People have to really understand and realize that if they live on top of a mountain and they go and play with the snow or they ski, they're playing with the ocean or they're skiing on the ocean. Mm -hmm. And all of that goes ultimately right into the ocean with everything we put into it, whether it's plastics, mm -hmm. which we're very sensitive about because it's our primary sense. And I'm happy to say that uh, there are different places now where we start doing that. Mm -hmm. But we never talk about what we don't see, which are heavy metals mm -hmm. and all kinds of chemicals. Pharmaceuticals. That's right. Pills. Where you take tablets. And taking the vascular right into the system. Hopefully it works. It takes care of the headache, but where is that chemical going? Mm -hmm. Right into Straight the ocean. Back. Yeah. So the huge opportunities today mm -hmm. to share that information with other people and their technicians and uh, biologists and so on who say, oh, we can create uh, little industries mm -hmm in the runoff water before they goes into the ocean mm -hmm. and we can recycle all of that because oh, in nature be there are no waste. Oh my god, that would be amazing. So not well, just filtering it for, for, for ourselves, but be, before it gets released back into the nature, gets filtered again. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Yeah. See, in nature there is no waste in nature. Uh, diversity is synonymous mm -hmm. of stability, mm -hmm. and we, everything is recycled. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are the ones, and particularly now more than ever before, we uh, adding another 100 million people to the planet every year. Mm -hmm. So the pressure on the environment is increasing. Mm -hmm. And what people really need to understand, and it's fun, it's interesting, it's fascinating, Every species, plants or animals on land or in the ocean is the capital. Mm -hmm. And we need to leave the capital. We need to not touch the capital. But anybody who is a business understand what it means. The capital produces profit. 
We can take the profit. We can take the profit, and that's what feeds us, takes care of us. That's an amazing concept. I never thought about it that way. And if we do that, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an issue of management. Mm -hmm. If we manage nature like we manage a business, we're going to be okay. And we need to never, never forget that uh, we showed up on the planet long after many other species existed. Mm -hmm. We could disappear and many species will keep going on. What's very important for us is to realize that we have the capability, the ability to take care of the capital and only consume the interest produced mm -hmm. by the capital. And we have to once and for all understand we're the only species that has the privilege to decide not to disappear. It's our choice. Yeah. So that's where we are today. Education, education, communication is very important, and mm -hmm. thanks to you, mm -hmm. we are able to share information with the general public, and people say, oh, I didn't know. What can I do? I want to help, and on and on. And mm -hmm. I'm very excited now. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to uh, uh, my dad, to our team, to uh, the people today, uh, the fact that uh, you never point a finger, you have three fingers pointing at you. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Everybody has a heart. Mm -hmm. And if you can have a dialogue, whether it's a, a, someone in government, which is elected for a very short period of time, and they don't think about further down, well, they have families, mm -hmm. they have children. So you want to make the bridge between their obligation and the future. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the industries, the mm -hmm. big industries. I don't want industries to go out of business. I want them to switch from, for example, the kind of energy that they produce today to a different kind of energy. Right. And there are many, many right. ways now to do that. Mm -hmm. And we're heading in that direction. And the profit that they were making and at the expense of the environment, uh, we can use it for new ways of taking care mm -hmm. of the environment, of ourselves, mm -hmm. and making sure we don't disappear. Right. Well, that goes um, right along with the mission that is on your card, and that is in every video and your TED Talk. I want to talk to you also as a filmmaker to filmmaker, because yes. what you've just said in the beginning a little bit that um, kind of blows my mind three years of, you know, filming this incredible documentary. I kind of I don't know if it's a documentary. This is an experience. It's Bec an adventure. Right. Because <laughs> because when you're sitting there, especially on 3D and you're watching this, you're experiencing it. I, I come from like the largest landlocked country in the world, Kazakhstan. Yeah. There's no ocean there. Of course, we have seas. There's and we, ocean everywhere. Right. You it, are 60% of the ocean. Of course, yes. Like me. Mm -hmm. And all the plants and all the animals depend on the, that water that comes, right. the rain. of course. From the ocean. Right, of course. And then it goes right back into the ocean yeah. with everything we put into it. But as far as the experience concerned, uh, I don't. not everyone has a, uh, an incredible life like yours going into the world that seems to be so alien. And that is in, in, what, what's incredible about what you do is that you brought it to the screens for people to see and be familiar with. So it's no longer yes. so alien. And you start caring about that. And that I think is an, um, is an amazing accomplishment, really. For me, it's so exciting to be able to share uh, not only images, but stories with the public, wherever they live. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, to make sure we all understand that every other breath of air we breathe is coming from the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, whether you live near the ocean or up in the mountain, it makes absolutely no difference. Mm -hmm. We're all connected to that water mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And that's why our mission at Ocean Futures, which I created after my father passed away, is if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself which is your mission, yes. Right. And um, if you protect the ocean, in, in that case, what I can see from what you're saying and getting to know you a little bit right now is that when you say ocean, you don't say 
just the ocean. You say everything. Water. Water. And uh, no water, no life. Right. We and are we mostly all connected. water. We're yeah. all connected yes. to water one way or the other. Right. And uh, it's very precious, very important. We need to understand how it works and mm -hmm. how much we depend upon it. And we also need to know to uh, not abuse it, mm -hmm. to manage it like you manage a business. Same old story. Yeah. You know. <laughs> And uh, so, and there are more and more people doing that. I'm very excited with young people, particularly, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in government or industries, but also in uh, the school system with our program, Ambassador of the Environment, uh, which we share in uh, different hotels, uh, the Ritz Carlton in different places. Uh, um, Catalina Island has been going on there for 20 years now mm -hmm. with one program which is called KELP, mm -hmm. Catalina Environmental Leadership Program, mm -hmm. where we can get kids from downtown Los Angeles uh, who have never seen the ocean because they're from very poor families, where we can bring them to the Catalina and for them to spend a week or 10 days and really connect and understand how we are connected to that ocean mm -hmm and the quality of it. Mm -hmm. And we have that on cruise ships and other places, and it's expanding. We just mm -hmm. opened one up here at uh, Baccarat, the Ritz-Carlton, mm -hmm. up uh, about 10 minutes away from where we are right now, up on the coastline in Santa Barbara. It, it's, it's amazing, and it's uh, very exciting because we're getting feedback now from people who have been exposed to our programs 10, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. ago and they tell us that all the decisions they make today are impacted by w the experience or the uh, adventure that they shared with us mm -hmm. when they were kids. So it works. Spreading the spirit of uh, f uh, respect for nature, basically. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Everything yeah. is a secret and uh, everything is a treasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing to when you start, and I'm not an expert, in, particularly in plants on land, but I'm finding out that there are plants that can do all kinds of things to help us. And whether it's a pharmaceutical product or creatures or animals which depend upon these plants in order to survive or to uh, get fed or to uh, uh, communicate with others and so mm -hmm. on, it's nonstop. It's incredible. And in the ocean, yeah. Uh, there are probably thousands and thousands of species we have yet to discover. How can you protect them if we don't know who they are, what they are? And uh, so that's why I'm so excited with the exosuit now, mm -hmm. which uh, took me six days to be certified up in Alaska, in uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, was a friend of mine, uh, Phil Newton, in uh, Vancouver, where I was there with other people learning the exosuit, where now you're in a, in a suit which is really metal, mm -hmm. but you're totally flexible in it. You protect it from the pressure. Mm -hmm. Wow. They put you in the water, you're free. And How you deep? Two propulsion system on the side, two propulsion system on the on in the front and with your right leg you can go forward back left right with your left leg you can go up and down and you have high definition camera on top mm -hmm. of your head you have led lights on your tummy because at 300 feet or a thousand you know yeah. it's dark yeah. so you want to be able to see what's there and your hands are uh, repeated mechanically and you can take samples for the scientific community. Ah, Incredible. So I'm just certified, and I want to go there and discover and film hundreds, thousands of species that we have not yet seen. Before we started our conversation, we talked a little bit about how incredible is technological progress for filming marine world, right? Yeah. So um, how did it change for documentary filmmaking? Well, things have changed a mm -hmm. lot. 
And the attention of people is getting much smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're trying to make little stories that can be on different ways of communication with the public, not just on mm-hmm. our uh, website, but everywhere. And then we also want to attract them to uh, some amazing uh, reality of nature, which we all connect on and depend upon. Mm-hmm. And that's why we've gotten involved more and more into a uh, uh, feature film length, uh-huh. uh, The Wonders of the Sea, uh, uh, with the help of uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, who was a very well-known uh, uh, person here in California who is now very dedicated to the environment it's and the yeah. protection of mm-hmm. the environment. Uh, he volunteered and gave his voice uh, to the show uh, as his contribution. Mm-hmm. It's been amazing. Uh, so we want to share with the public as much as we can. And another way of me approaching the whole thing is that I've been diving for 73 years. I'm the oldest diver diving still uh, because I started when I was seven years of age and nobody in those days uh, who were adults uh, either still on the planet or they uh, are not diving anymore. Mm. So I feel some responsibilities mm-hmm. to sharing with the public my the experience that I've had and the fact that I've had all that exposure and in many, many, many parts of the planet, uh, I want to be involved now in a television series Mm -hmm. where we have actors and actresses who are going to do what we tell them to do. Because I'm not an actor. Right. And uh, sometimes I may say things not the very nice way or so kind of in a stupid way or whatever. But actors, they listen and they try to do what they're being told to do mm-hmm. or to act. Mm-hmm. And I want to help those people to do the right thing. Go down and... Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. And uh, I want to be with a young lady, for example, who wants to learn to scuba dive and I want to help her mm-hmm. and tell her. And then uh, we're going to find out that maybe she's going to have problems. Well, I want to help her mm-hmm. and make sure she can go through this. It's an ones. amazing idea. So Why not? I yeah. want to do that mm-hmm. because with my experience, I want to share that mm-hmm. with people and for uh, hopefully with a new uh, way of communicating with uh, the public at mm-hmm. large in a very entertaining way. Mm-hmm. Well, um I think it's a fabulous idea because um, think about it, meaning I'm thinking about it up loud, uh, that if you get actors, they're, they're, they're human beings and some of them haven't had this experience. So you'll be able to like see them go through that and learn certain things and adapt to that mentality that you already have of unity with That's everything. Right. That's right. That's pretty incredible. Are you a, a, a diver? No, I've never, I've never done that in my well, life. Well, maybe we can uh, have you do it. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd <laughs> love to. I'd be very scared, but I'd love to. Good. Yeah. <laughs> because I want you to learn not to be scared. Yeah. And I will let you know what to do, what not to do. Okay. So not to be scared. Okay. I'll, I'll definitely <laughs> do it. Definitely. So when was your first movie done and how did you get into filmmaking? Well... My father started, let's say, uh, in a very big public way Mm -hmm. with the film which was called The Silent World, Mm -hmm. which was a feature film, a documentary, Mm -hmm. and it got the Palme d'Or in Cannes. Mm -hmm. So it instantly made my dad a very, very uh, well-known filmmaker. Mm -hmm. He had a great team. And his team never stopped being part of our expeditions. And then very quickly, we got involved into uh, television, Mm -hmm. our specials. And uh, because I was a young diver, Mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid, I wanted to become a 
because of the exposure that I had with the ocean, I wanted to become an architect mm. because I felt that maybe one day we humans would go and move underwater and live underwater. No way. <laughs> Who knows? And uh, my father said, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, go, go for it. So I became an architect. I'm a licensed architect in the European Union. Uh, in those days, I had to do my military service like mm -hmm. everybody else. And I uh, chose to do it in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. I spent 23 years over there. I designed mm -hmm. and supervised the construction of six schools. Oh, wow. One dispensary uh, was involved in an inexpensive uh, building construction. I was involved in a university uh, because the architects uh, were putting the uh, uh, protection of the sun on the wrong side because mm -hmm. <laughs> putting you in the southern hemisphere is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was fascinated and I was there and I was diving, diving, diving all over in the Indian Ocean. Uh, every weekend or every vacation, mm -hmm. I was out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then my dad one day called me and he said, oh, we we are filming in the Red Sea, but we cannot go ba back to the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, you've been diving all over the Indian Ocean. Maybe you can help me mm -hmm. because I want to know where we should go. How old were you? I was 28 or 29. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, of course. And so I organized the destination of the ship because they needed food, they needed to connect with scientists mm -hmm. uh, and find out, you know, what are we going to find there. And mm -hmm. So I was kind of organizing the expeditions and that thing led to another and another. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother was involved and uh, my mother was on board. She had moved on the ship mm -hmm. uh, many years before that, mm -hmm. at the very beginning of Calypso, and uh, <coughs> she was the real boss. She was the captain. That's a separate story. I want to talk about your mom. Yeah, well, that my mom moment. was an amazing lady. She mm -hmm. uh, uh, was um, from a uh, an admiral of the French Navy. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a beautiful lady. My grandmother who was the first woman I fell in love with. Uh, I, I was, when she got sick, I was on her, the side of her bed. I was holding her hand and I was telling her, you're the most beautiful woman on the planet. Aww. As a child, and it was very emotional and she couldn't answer because she had a cancer. And anyway, and- uh, That's your mom's mom. That was my mom, mom mm -hmm. and my uh, dad, uh, fell in love with her and uh, my grandfather, her father, uh, was very, very helpful in everything we were doing at the time as an admiral because mm -hmm. he had been in the French Navy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later on he moved to, uh, when he retired, he moved to uh, Air Liquide in Paris mm -hmm. and that's where he introduced an engineer to my dad and together they co-invented the regulator, which is what we use still today to go diving disconnected uh -huh. from the surface. Mm -hmm. Because my father, when he went in the Navy himself, he uh, was very close to some friends whom I've known them mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, and uh, they were spearfishing. Uh -huh. And my father would, wanted to film them. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't hold his breath as long as these guys. And that's why he said, oh, I need to bring air with me. <laughs> and through my mother, connected right. with my grandfather at early kid. And uh, all of this uh, allowed him to, with the engineer, to uh, create the regulator. Mm. And that's immediately after that, when I was seven and after it was tested, that uh, I went diving with my family, with my father, mother, and my brother. But uh, when the equipment was created, it was created in Paris, because that's where early kids headquarters is. Mm -hmm. So uh, my dad uh, <laughs> was testing, testing the equipment. And then one day he asked my mother, 
why don't you go and see if it works? And they send her in La Marne River, which is a little river of Paris, mm -hmm. which is full of pollution, by the way. Oh. And my mother came back, and she was the first woman scuba diving. And we went diving together That's, many times. Yeah, and you were like you were telling me about her powerful nature when she was on board. Tell us about well, it. Well, you know, she uh, she wanted to go on the ship. She didn't want to stay home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, my brother and I, we had to go to school, so we went to a boarding school. Mm -hmm. But all the vacation, we would try to catch up with Calypso, the ship, wherever the ship was. Mm -hmm. Well, in those days, it wasn't that easy mm -hmm. as it is today. Communication wise, there was no phone, no, no emails, computer, and <laughs> no <laughs> emails, and, and so, on. so yeah. it, it wasn't easy. But we ultimately we did it most of the time without any problem. I have a few stories, but mm -hmm. uh, that's, anyway. And then uh, my mother had decided to move on the ship. She packed her bags and said goodbye, and she moved to the ship, and uh, she became the real uh, mental boss of the ship with 23 people, men, mm -hmm. uh, who could communicate with her about the problems they had at home or uh, what they were missing or maybe mm -hmm. uh, if they had, you know, feel a physical questions or mm -hmm. whatever. And um, she um, really, uh, those people always adored her. Mm -hmm. She was diving once in a while, but not that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wanted to be uh, left out of the film. She didn't want to be part of the documentaries. It was very difficult for me later on to get images to uh, of her uh, being involved with the team or images with the team. Mm -hmm. But we we got some of it. A Good. Bit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, everyone always loved her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, as I said spend more time on the ship than my father, my brother, and myself together. Mm -hmm. So, mm. so she's she, an amazing she, lady. She must have shared that mentality that you have today about the oneness and everything. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. No, she was, uh, and she was sharing it with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't uh, my brother and I, it was uh, 23 brothers. <laughs> you know? I can understand that. Yeah, <laughs> she I can understand. literally was close to every one yeah. of them, and I have a lot of written stories from people who have uh, who really wanted to express themselves about how mm -hmm. Simon Cousteau was uh, really very special and made it mm -hmm. a very important part of their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. Back to the documentaries, not not even like we'll, we'll get back to the one that is actually the the, the newest one that is coming out in theaters, which Wonders I'm of the so sea. excited about because I I can't wait to see those images in 3D. But going all the way back to when you you started making your own first documentaries, um, what is it? I mean, what does it take uh, to become a marine documentarist? Beside well, first of all, you have to be surrounded by qualified people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I've learned thanks to my dad and mm -hmm. his team. And I've never stopped doing that. And mm -hmm. many of the people, uh, even after my father passed away and my mother passed away before he did, mm -hmm. uh, these people kept working with me. Mm -hmm. So we've never stopped. And uh, things have changed. The technology has changed. Mm -hmm. We used to shoot uh, 16 millimeter. Mm -hmm. now, now we're talking about totally different of approach. Yeah. And um, I've been very privileged to be involved in the editing uh, here in California uh, in the early days. Mm -hmm. Ted Turner was a critical uh, investor mm -hmm. uh, in some of my father's original films. Mm -hmm. That gave me a chance to spend uh, two years uh, in the Amazon, and we filmed six hours of televisions. And then later on, about uh, 12 years ago, I went with my children mm -hmm. because they both were with us when I was there in 1983, 84. And uh, 
uh, my mom was keeping an eye on my children or I was taking my son on a boat somewhere. Uh, and <clears throat> we've been back 12 years ago and we did a show, uh, Return to the Amazon, mm. a two hour special. Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> I've wanted to uh, go where my father had never been. And I know he wanted to go to the North Western Hawaiian Islands mm -hmm. in Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I found enough uh, support because, you know, I'm a producer, mm -hmm. but I'm not a businessman. I'm not, uh, I've not inherited the funds which allows us to do whatever we want to do. Mm -hmm. We have to buy, find somebody who wants to help us doing what we want to produce mm -hmm. and what we want to do. So it's very important to communicate with people who have the resources mm -hmm. and uh, if they're interested in what we do, to do it. And that has never, never stopped, whether it's with my dad, with me, mm -hmm. with my brother at the time before he passed away. And uh, now it's the same thing with my children and my nephew and my niece. Mm -hmm. uh, we all trying to help and protect the environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks to uh, the uh, connections that we have and the ocean that fascinates us, nature that fascinates us, uh, we are able to continue. And my daughter, for example, um, who uh, inherited with my brother, but it's my son, uh, the house where I grew up in saint Henri near Toulon, she decided to go there to give birth to my grandson Aww. seven years ago. And he was born underwater. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, Cousteau generation number four yeah. is wet. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. And we love it. Yeah, of course. And it's funny. It's, uh, I love him. It's yeah. going to be his birthday next week. Oh, happy <clears> birthday. <throat> Wonderful. Four generations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I will never stop. Yeah. So how is this new documentary that is coming out on screens, how is that different than anything you've done before? I think uh, mostly because uh, of the technology that we can use mm -hmm. that uh, we couldn't use before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, technicians and uh, uh, the uh, film team and uh, the brothers, the Montello brothers, the French mm -hmm. team, and uh, cameraman uh, from uh, the Caribbean and mm -hmm. technicians from other places, they managed to uh, put together all the equipment uh, that could allow us now mm -hmm. to on tripods on the ocean floor uh, with lights and so on uh, to uh, be able to film in slow motion, up close, behavior we've never seen before. It's incredible. Yeah. That's really incredible. No, it's a very, very, very exciting, and mm -hmm. we're going to be able to do more and more of that, but also uh, go deeper and deeper and uh, look at uh, mm -hmm. species we've never seen. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. You know, like, the, the deep waters is actually some of my biggest fears. And so, like, when you were talking about me possibly diving, that would be me conquering that. No problem. <laughs> uh, you're not the first one. Yeah. but I've heard a lot of people like you. Really? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I can imagine. So, in this, in this film, uh, besides technical stuff, because I can, I, can, I can feel your passion for what you do, so besides technical stuff in that movie, any any like new maybe um, you know b b view on on the same subject matter something something else besides what you've been talking about before. Well, uh, I think by better knowing what's there and mm -hmm. understanding how it functions. It uh, allows us to communicate with the general public who has been abused, amongst other ways, by taking advantage of their lack of knowledge by mm -hmm. Hollywood, mm -hmm. uh, by scaring you with sharks, and, mm -hmm. uh, and on and on and on. So fixing those mistakes for people, replacing their beliefs with new beliefs. Well, we want to show them the reality. Yeah. Okay. You know, 
they are uh, the, the biggest fish in the ocean ever happens to be a shark. It's called a whale shark. Mm -hmm. Has no teeth. Oh. So Hollywood could make a film <laughs> that is going to scare people with no teeth. Yeah. <laughs> they picked up the great white shark. Yeah. Well, the great white shark is not the one that has caused the most accidents. Mm -hmm. And the accidents that have taken place are accidents. They don't like us. Mm -hmm. We don't taste good. But they need to find food. And the food they find is uh, sea lions, mm -hmm. uh, maybe big fish, mm -hmm. or whatever. Now, our primary sense, you and mine, humans anyway, mm -hmm. is vision. Vision. Mm -hmm. The primary sense of sharks is smell. That's the primary sense. Now, if they are in water where the water is not clear, and let's say I can't see you, but you maybe you're releasing some blood. Mm -hmm. You got a cut or something. Oh, they can smell the blood. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. It's my primary sense. So I want to go and try. And I tried, oh, ugh, ugh, I don't like that, and swim away. But accidents happen a yeah. lot with uh, surfers and mm -hmm. so on. Because a surfer, even if uh, the water, let's say the water is not that clear, but a surfer, you look at it from underneath, and you're on your surfboard, you look like a sea lion from underneath. Mm -hmm. So. I've been diving 73 years and I'm very, very careful because there are situations where I don't go. Mm -hmm. I want to keep my fingers. And, uh, and I share that with my friends as much as I can. And, uh, but I can go and swim and dive with any sharks, mm. depending on the situation. If the water is clear, no blood in the water, nobody fishing, because if yeah, there's yeah. a fish on the line, the shark wants to get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I learned from a very good friend who uh, in uh, South Africa uh, was a fisherman before and he was very worried because he was spearfishing and uh, he was afraid that the great white shark would come to take the fish. And he said, he's gonna cut me, he's gonna hurt me. and. Uh, he decided, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to show people that great white sharks are not the nasty creatures that people think. If the water is clear, there's no blood in the water. The great white shark comes, look at you, and keeps swimming, not mm -hmm. interested. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll show you, Jean-Michel. Uh, you can grab the upper backside of the dorsal fin because there are no nerve endings. Oh, wow. And you can take a ride. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, no, 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 you are <laughs> And after a few days, he showed me how to do it, and I had to do it. So you ride sharks now? Yeah, we filmed oh it. Oh, my God. <laughs> but he told me, he said, don't touch the front, don't try to grab the, uh, the tail, and so on. They don't like that. And he showed it to me. He did it and showed me. And he said, but the upper backside of the dorsal fin, no nerve endings. You can grab it and take a ride. So here is a 16 foot long great white shark, a female, and she comes by, I grab it, and here I am going, 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 and I had to let go because I couldn't hold it longer enough. I was <laughs> just holding my breath, you know? <laughs> That's amazing. So it was a way for me to share with the public, yeah. you know, if you do the right thing, you understand how it works, mm -hmm. you're gonna be okay. And that's for a lot of people to to appreciate because mm -hmm. I don't like people to get scared by nature. We need to understand how it works. And the biggest champion surfer of the planet is a lady in Hawaii who was surfing and uh, she was on a surfboard, the water wasn't clear and the shark came and cut, cut her arm, mm. and she lost her arm. Mm -hmm. That unbelievable lady is the strongest 
protector of sharks today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have so much respect for of her. Of course, of course. So we need to understand. But we have to be careful anywhere, in anywhere in nature. But we have to yeah. learn. Yeah. We have to understand. We, and that's ultimately what you're doing, because what that's you're right. doing is is that you undermining the fear of unknown. You're bringing the knowledge yeah. on screens for people yeah. to see. And that's beautiful. So we're back to, you know, education, but education can be very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And it's nonstop, mm -hmm. absolutely nonstop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said something at the beginning um, that is going to be stuck with me. It's the concept of capital and profit. Yes. Uh, which is ultimately living in balance with nature. Do you know if anyone is doing anything about it? Not only filtering stuff that we intake, but also filtering stuff before we release it. I think it's amazing. D do you know if anyone's doing anything about that? More and more. Really? Now, let's, let's go back to uh, things people understand very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On land, when there were more and more people and we were totally dependent on getting plants or animals to feed ourselves, mm -hmm. there was no more plants and animals available to massive amount of people. What did we do? We became farmers. What are we farming? We're not farming lions and jaguars. They probably taste very good. I've never tried. Mm -hmm. But they are carnivores. You need a lot of meat to make one pound or one kilo right. of these animals. So what are we farming? Well, we're farming herbivores. Right. Cows. Mm -hmm. Sheep. Chicken. Chickens, yeah. Sheep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And omnivore pigs. Yeah. Uh, pigs eat they all eat the leftovers. Yes, yes, yes. Like us? Yeah. <laughs> like oh. us. Okay. So, uh, when it comes to the ocean, we're taking more from the ocean, we're polluting the ocean, mm -hmm. and many of the species we should cut and put in our plates, by the way, like uh, oysters. Mm -hmm. You know, people love oysters. I used to love oysters. I mm -hmm. don't touch them anymore. Really? Because of all the pollution that mm -hmm. comes out, the chemicals and heavy metals go in an oyster. And when you eat an oyster, what do you eat? You eat the whole thing. Yeah. Wow. So all clams are filter feeders. Mm -hmm. And then you have many, many species that eat other species and so on. And we catch fish. Well, a lot of these chemicals and heavy metals are accumulating inside the fish. Now, we don't eat their guts, usually, most of us. Some of us probably do, but we don't, unlike the oysters and mm -hmm. the clams. Well, we need to find out that uh, there are species that are being abused and we're taking more than nature can produce. Mm -hmm. And there are samples where fishing uh, industries has been controlled or has been uh, regulated mm -hmm. and so on. But it's still some too much is being taken. And the pollution is accelerating the process mm -hmm. of disappearing several species. Mm -hmm. We started farming some species. Unfortunately, the most popular one are carnivores. Oh, really? I didn't even realize that. Salmon. Right. A carnivore. Mm -hmm. And you have, and I'm, uh, and I'm saying this with excitement because it's good news. Mm -hmm. Salmon from a different parts of the world, not the Pacific Ocean, started to be farmed in Canada. And they need to feed them. So to make one pound of an introduced species, between 8 and 12 pounds of wild fish, whatever is left in the ocean, oh, wow. to make one pound wow. mm -hmm. of that salmon. That's absurd. It We're is. accelerating the disappearance of many species. Mm -hmm. So this has to stop. Yes. And I, I in the case of what was that. happening in mm -hmm. Canada, mm -hmm. I just found out, this is recent mm -hmm. news, 
the uh, decision makers have decided to cut it off, to stop it. That's a good news. It is good news, mm -hmm. particularly since the farm salmon place was next to a river mm -hmm. where the wild open ocean salmon go all the way every year, go up the river, up and up and up and up where they were born. Right. They gave birth. They're little baby salmon, which are about that size, mm -hmm. that now are starting to come down the river into the ocean. Well, they're being attached, attacked by all kinds of creatures. Right. And I counted six, up to 62 little creatures on these little fish. More than 50% would die. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. So that's happening because of the farm salmons that are right there at the entrance of the river. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Wow. So the good news is that now we need, and there are people more and more, mm -hmm. to learn to farm non-carnivore uh, species, mm -hmm. and there are quite a few. And uh, there is a gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Dr. Zohar. I've known him for many years. My mm -hmm. father knew him, by mm -hmm. the way, at the uh, University of, uh, what is it, Arlington on, on the East Coast, mm -hmm. where he can now produce in his lab different species of herbivores very successfully. I've tested seven species myself. Mm -hmm. And some of those, when they get to be big, well, it's not his business, so he sells them, they're sold by the mm -hmm. university to the local restaurants. And I went to those restaurants to ask the people, do you like the fish? And they all did. Mm -hmm. And they are herbivores. We can farm them like we farm chicken. That's amazing. So we're gonna be able to do that. And the good news, the good news is that you can, you're going to be able to farm it where the demand is. In Chicago. Right. In London. Right. In Paris. And for the first time, people will get some fresh fish. Mm -hmm. Now, when you eat a fish, you don't pay for the fish. Fish is free. But you pay for catching it. Right, that's right. Transporting it, freezing it. Now, if the farm is where the demand is, you don't have to catch it, you don't have to transport it or freeze it. No emission of CO2. <laughs> Contribution to the acceleration of the climate change. And the fact that the ocean temperature is rising, which means the ocean is rising itself mm -hmm. because it expands a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it creates energy that is available for storms and hurricanes. And we're going to have the biggest uh, waves uh, in the next few days right here mm -hmm. on the coast. And also uh, acidification, which comes with CO2 which affects the uh, construction of coral reefs, which mm -hmm. is calcium carbonate, and it decomposes and falls like sand. Mm -hmm. And that's why there are places like in Florida and other places where 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of the coral reefs are dead. We can stop that. We know the effect and the condition and the consequences. Mm -hmm. So we can do it. And, let the nature and we recuperate. need to yeah. replace it with new sources of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to, sorry, but it was great. Uh, oil, forget about the oil. Uh, the sun, oh, the currents mm -hmm. in a river, in an ocean. And I found out because I was very worried that if you have a propeller, you know, it may go too fast. No, 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 no. What you have on, la on, on top of the surface 
those propellers that are going very fast is because air is compressible, mm -hmm. but water is not. So the equivalent of energy you can get on the surface versus underwater is three rotations mm -hmm. per minute, which means fish can swim right through it and there's mm -hmm. no problem. And we can do that in a river, we can do that uh, in the ocean. Wonderful. So there are mm -hmm. ideas and solutions, mm -hmm. and uh, there are people who are finding ways to take advantage of nature. For example, the difference of temperature between the deep ocean and shallow, uh, you can switch that around and create energy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are gentlemen here in town who created the pods that you put on your car, and uh, it uh, controls the movement of the car, mm -hmm. and it increases your uh, uh, performance per gallon of fuel by um, three, four, five miles per gallon. And uh, of course, now we're even thinking about no more oil, mm -hmm. electricity, and whatnot. But in the meantime, we need to uh, be able to go there. Mm -hmm. And I have that on my car. And uh, when I go down to uh, Los Angeles, well, I save money. <laughs> oh, oh. I save money and uh, I consume less fuel. Yeah. So what's the next project? Have you started thinking about the next project yet? Well, the next project for me is uh, try to start a television series Okay. Uh, with a, uh, a group actors. of people yeah. uh, uh, in France, mm -hmm. and uh, they're very sensitive because I want to design a new boat, mm -hmm. uh, which will be propelled by the sun or by the wind, mm -hmm. and uh, will allow us to be underwater wherever we are mm -hmm. and communicate via satellite with anybody on the planet uh, and answer questions to people. I've been doing that uh, in Fiji a few years ago, mm -hmm. where I was down in maybe 10 meters, and there were people, uh, and there was a cameraman and the lights and so on, but they were filming me, and I was answering questions mm -hmm. to people who were seeing me mm -hmm. on their computers or whatever in Canada and in Japan at the same time. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So we can connect anything in the ocean or any part of the planet to any human beings, 9.56 billion people on the planet, because there's no more borders. Mm -hmm. There is uh, what I call the communication revolution, mm -hmm. where every one of us has a cell phone and we can call, talk to each other wherever we live. Mm -hmm. Borders and there's an absurdity, a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. And what's exciting is that uh, the uh, human species is like any fish species or any bird species, uh, there are different colors, different languages, of course. Uh, different religion, different, yeah. cult, you know, different cultures. And, and <laughs> it would be so boring if we were all the same. And the accents, right? Fortunately, <laughs> you know. So we now are living yeah. a very, very exciting time mm. in our species. And uh, I, I am very, very excited, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad my children and my grandchildren uh, will uh, discover all of that. And you can no longer lie, steal, or cheat, because you're going to get caught. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of our viewers are filmmakers. Filmmakers? Yes. Um, hey. and, um, Follow I, your dreams. What, what I tell them all the way. Follow your dream. You can always find a way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I've learned a long, long, long time ago. Sometimes you struggle. It's not easy, but ultimately mm -hmm. you make it happen. Any specific advice for documentary filmmakers? Well, uh, w I think we need to uh, understand that the attention of the public is getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. And thus we need to have, as a documentary is, very small films to tell a story. It can be three minutes, seven minutes, whatever it is. And that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. 
I have learned a lot from our conversation. And um, coming here, I was a little bit worried because talking about environment always, you know, makes... Boring. Yeah. No, not boring. <laughs> it's actually kind of... A lot of, of it is boring. No, it's not. I don't think so because we are environment. To no, me. I know, of course. But I was, I was mostly thinking, well, is it going to be sad or something? No, no. Exactly. This is what I got from, from our conversation. I'm actually going to leave here with hope. And Absolutely. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe we're going to make it as a species. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to look at a five-year-old kid in the eyes and say, yeah. I want you to have the same privilege that I've had. Yeah. And that works. You have children, you know. Yeah. You want them to be. Of course. Be so we are in the process of making that happen. Well, thank you so much. You're very thank welcome. you. It was Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you.